Uh, welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. My name is Eric Sayers. I'm a non-resident fellow uh, here at AEI. Uh, and thanks for attending today's event, uh, both in person. We have a, kind of a full room here for the first time in two years, um, as well as virtually uh, at work or at home. Um, today's event uh, is the past, present, and future of U.S.-China relations. Uh, I thought we had a really good opportunity um, with the three folks that are here today to, to have this conversation. Um, I wanted to start with a brief story about um, you know, the last decade or so of U.S.-China relations and how things have shifted. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was at a conference with, a, with a, one of our allies, I won't say who it was, uh, in a room full of folks. And it was at a time where you know, the U.S. was a bit adrift and its focus on the Asia-Pacific or the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and our, our friends in the room from this allied country were kind of prodding us and saying, we need more from you. You need to focus more on the region. You know, China's doing X, Y, and Z. Um, and we just, we weren't there at that time. Flash forward a decade, just a few years ago, we were at that same conference, and these same people were in the similar room saying, whoa, slow down, you, you've, you've shifted too much. This is, this is not what we were asking for. Um, I, I think that's a, those, those 10 year, that 10 year uh, benchmark is a good indication of just how things changed so rapidly the last 10 years in US-China relations. Um, but it's, it's a broader indication, I think, of, of how a democracy in, like the United States during peacetime can change so slowly and then so rapidly. And that's really what we're here to talk about today. Um, I think two reasons have brought us together. One, we've got a really interesting opportunity uh, with the three people on the stage today uh, who are all in, in recent years serving as, as directors for China at the National Security Council. Um, Matt Turpin, uh, and Ivan Canapathy, and Liza Tobin. Uh, and uh, most times when you serve in that role at the NSC, uh, you go back to your home agency. Um, but if for, for unique reasons, uh, the three people with us here today uh, were, were just leaving government or at the, at the end of their time in government and have moved on to other jobs. So one reason we're here today is we just have this unique chance to talk at the director level with folks who served previously at the NSC across the last two administrations, so really saw these shifts as they were happening. The second reason I wanted to kind of bring us together today was because we normally talk to um, we talk about what's happening in Washington or what's happening in Beijing or what should be happening. I think to really understand where we are and where we're going, it's important to kind of look back the, the last five or 10 years and how we changed so rapidly and what those reasons were to kind of question how enduring this shift is, if we have a new consensus on US-China relations or Washington's approach to China, and then just what's locked in and what's still in question going forward. Um, and so I'm gonna to start today um, with five or six comments, five or six minutes of comments from, from each of our, our speakers. I'm gonna have uh, them speak uh, from, from far away first, uh, from, from Matt Turpin to start. Uh, and I'm gonna ask them each to, to give just a couple of minutes on, on how they came to focus on China in their career. And then as they observed this change, uh, both in their time, uh, in, in Matt's case in the Army, in Ivan's case in the Marine Corps, and Liza from, from the intelligence community, uh, how they came to focus on China uh, before they went into their roles and then what they observed uh, in their time uh, serving both in the Trump and, and Biden administrations. And then we'll come back to some, some few more questions from me and then an interesting turn of events. We'll take questions from the audience and not just virtually uh, and then we'll, we'll round out the hour. So Matt, we'll start with you. Sure, well thanks Eric and, and so thanks for, for having me on the stage with, with two good friends. Uh, Ivan and, and Liza, it's, it's great to be in person again, so, so, so thank you. Um, so how did I, I come to, to, to focus on, on U.S.-China policy? And it goes back about uh, 12 years. I, I, um, I'd been serving in the Army. Uh, I had returned from a, a, a tour in Iraq, and I had an option of being a, a, a CENTCOM LNO in the Pentagon or a war planner out at Pacific Command. And it was a fairly easy choice uh, to, to spend time uh, for three years living in Hawaii. Um, and obviously, this was happening simultaneously with, uh, you know, at the time, Secretary Clinton's uh, uh, sort of pivot to Asia, right? America's Pacific Century, if, if anybody will remember, uh, a piece written by her uh, in, in sort of, I think, late 2011 or mid-2011 in, in Foreign Affairs which signaled sort of a, 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 begin, a beginning of a sort of a policy shift uh, for the United States. And so I, I sent, essentially sort of rode that shift uh, from my position out at, at Pacific Command uh, and then brought back uh, to the Pentagon uh, for a, a four-year joint tour 
uh, on the joint staff as the joint staff's representative in the National Security Council. Um, so got a chance to work for, uh, for General Dempsey uh, and, and Admiral Winnefeld as, as the vice chairman, and then for General Dunford um, and General Selva uh, as, as they took their positions. So really for the last <clears throat> sort of four years of the Obama administration uh, served as, as, as a military representative of the National Security Council and got to see um, and experience and take part in uh, sort of the policy discussions that were happening at the end of the Obama administration, uh, as it was becoming increasingly clear that our, our, our strategic approach to the PRC uh, was not resulting in the kinds of, of, of outcomes that we had preferred. And really, in the last two years of the Obama administration, going through a deep introspection about uh, you know, what would be the appropriate response uh, and the appropriate strategy for the United States. Um, and then I had, I had the opportunity uh, that as I, I retired from the Army um, in, in, in mid-2017, I uh, was invited back by, by General McMaster, then the National Security Council, or the National Security Advisor, uh, to come back and be uh, the China Director uh, on, 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 the, on the Security Council. And that, that allowed me to spend essentially two years as we shifted from the National Security Strategy published in December of 2017, and then implementing that strategy uh, sort of over the next two years. And so got to see that full, that sort of full arc. Um, and, and to be honest, you know, my background was, was not at all in, in China or Asia policy. I'm, a, I'm, I'm an American historian. I, I taught uh, at, at West Point. Um, but that background of, of being sort of a, a historian gave me sort of the tools to sort of learn uh, sort of a new national security challenge or, or like the reinvigoration of a national security challenge uh, for the United States. And so I, I took, I had sort of an outsider's view of broader China policy. Um, and, and I think that was, that was helpful during this period of transition. Ivan. Hi, Ivan Canapathy. Um, so my story is a little different from Matt's. I actually have, you know, some family background in the sense that my mother is, She's Chinese, now Chinese-American, but originally from Hong Kong. I spent my childhood in Hong Kong. Uh, we came over here when I was 11. Um, kind of set that, I guess, aside for a little while, at least didn't intermingle it with my professional life as I kind of embarked on my career in the Marine Corps, you know, after college and everything. And I, uh, I flew jets in the Marine Corps the first half of my career, uh, flying F-18s, which was, you know, as, as great, if not better than it sounds. Um, but at some point, you know, I was offered the opportunity, you know, to go through the Marine Corps to learn more about China. And uh, this was like the mid 2000s when I applied for the program and a lot of real sort of optimism about US China relations, a very different view that pervaded. And I kind of went through my master's program there and spent a year traveling and studying in China. I was there for the Olympics. Um, it was a great time to be over there, but at the same time, you know, in hindsight, it was also, I was also there when, you know, Lehman Brothers collapsed and, you know, all that was happening at the same time. And so very significant events that, you know, we, we look back on now and realize just how, um, how the tide was turning really, really at that time, um, in U.S. China relations. And I kind of came back, flew for a while, but ended up you know, having gotten that opportunity to train and learn more about China, security studies of the Asia Pacific, I then served a little bit later, um, and this was toward the end of the Obama administration. I served in Taiwan as a military attache, um, and I was there through the early part of the Trump administration, came back here to Washington, and then uh, after a quick stint at the Pentagon, went over to the NSC uh, right around the time when Matt got there in early 2018 and uh, kind of rode, rode that out through the early part of the Biden administration. So that's kind of the story, you know, where I fit in there. Matt talked a little bit about how things evolved. Obviously, it kind of had a, in some cases, a very front row seat. And we'll, uh, I guess we'll talk about that here as we go on. Liza. Thanks, Eric. Thanks so much for having us and, and pulling together some, some old friends for this, this great session. So um, 
you know, Eric asked us to walk through our origin story and it makes sense that I'm going last because in terms of chronological order, Matt was first at the NSC and I overlapped with him a little bit. Ivan and I overlapped significantly and then I came on last and was there from July 2019 to November just last year. So my origin story in terms of how I got into this field was um, really, so I, I also, like Ivan, have a little bit of a family background. Some of my ancestors on my dad's side came over to the US from Guangdong province and settled in Hawaii. So I have family connections there. I'm a quarter Chinese. Um, and I got the opportunity to spend time in China first as a teenager and then during college and graduate school. And after that, and in, in college, I started studying, studying the language and, and got to spend some time in Xiamen and then later in Nanjing and fell in love with the, the language and the culture and the people. And those were you know, the early 2000s, really kind of the, the heyday of, I'd say, Americans engaging with China. It had already really sort of developed to a point and was open to a point where um, you know, there, was, there was just a lot of people-to-people -people ties. Um, so I went to graduate school here at Johns Hopkins Sites across the street, and that was still, I would say, uh, you know, I was studying international relations and international economics, and um, the consensus was still very strong around the benefits of globalization. You know, the, those views were still very much intact. They hadn't been popped by the global financial crisis or other subsequent events. Um, and so after graduating, I sort of fell into national security almost by accident because of my language skills and, and regional expertise, not because I was seeking some kind of a national security career or I was particularly hawkish. Um, so I would say my awakening to the PRC as the United States' primary long-term strategic threat came rather late and it was somewhat gradual. Um, as an analyst, I started to see a growing convergence between how the CCP was describing their goals and their official speeches and their documents and then their actions and their behavior. So um, I think that um, you know, their, their goals as expressed in these documents started sort of matching up with what they were doing. Um, and really a critical moment was in October 2017 this was when Xi Jinping pulled the party together for the 19th Party Congress, and which is a, a gathering of all of the top party members every five years where the party looks back on what they've done in the last few years and makes an evaluation and then looks forward and, and updates their goals for the coming five years. So in that speech, I was kind of up late at night in Hawaii where I was working at the time um, trying to listen to this live stream of Xi Jinping while I was half asleep. And I remember hearing him say, it's time for China to lead the reform of global governance. Um, and that kind of woke me up in the middle of the night. And I, I thought, wow, that's, you know, they're really coming out and saying it. Um, so that was kind of a turning point for me um, as an analyst who had been kind of raised in an environment of China studies that I think largely emphasized Chinese leaders as being focused on domestic issues, focused mainly on staying in power, uh, focused on economic growth, these sort of uh, near-term uh, domestic concerns. And it became quite clear as I, as I listened more closely to what she was saying that indeed they do have global ambitions, which I think in 2022 is not particularly controversial, but even as late as 2017, there were still a lot of arguments about whether you could characterize the CCP as having Global, global ambitions. So um, I came back to Washington and in 2019 when I was asked to serve on the NSC, I, I, I joined Ivan and Matt in the China Directorate. Thanks, Liz. Um, I want to just spend the next 20 minutes asking a few questions and I'm not going to put you back on the hot spot. I'm going to, you can jump in or, or, or ignore as you wish. I think it's gr first to point out a benefit to all of working on Asia policy is you get to spend at some point in your career in Hawaii. I got to do the same thing. Um, and that's for, for young folks watching. Um, first question, and I'm just picking up on something Loiza fin finished on there. It was controversial. What we now take as consensus to some degree was controversial just five years ago. You know, do we have a new consensus? 
on Washington? Have we washed away the previous view? Uh, and if so, you know, how enduring is that? And, and how did that come about in your mind? And, and again, to, to all three of you who would like to jump in. I, I think we do have a new consensus. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's palpable how different the discussion is uh, today to where we were. You know, as I, as I arrived in Washington in the summer of 2013, um, you know, it's just, it was just sort of seeped in a very different discussion. Uh, you know, discussions about strategic competition were really relegated to closed door rooms and very sort of internal to government discussions. Um, and now that discussion is sort of openly made um, in, now that doesn't mean that, that there aren't still views on that, but essentially that is the starting point that we're at. Um, and we're imagining sort of, you know, what a future could look like where we are, we are more cooperative. But sort of the assumption is, is that what we're in is a, is a long-term strategic competition, and that that is the, the construct that we should view it from. Um, and so I think that's, and increasingly that's, that's across sort of the three buckets that I sort of view of US policy, you know, a national security bucket, a human rights bucket, and, and a sort of an economic bucket. But increasingly, that's the consensus across all three, and, and, and that had never sort of been that way in the past. Um, and to me, the, the, the real shift was, you know, it, it was surprising to me to watch you know, places like the US Chamber of Commerce, um, the EU Chamber of Commerce issuing reports at the end of 16 and into 2017, you know, looking at the harm that Chinese industrial policies do to the United States and really asking the US government and asking governments across Europe to do much more to sort of push back. And that had not been ne nearly the, the, the kind of discussion that had been going on. And I think that, that really started to change sort of the overall tone and tenor of sort of policy discussions, and you were sort of able to come out and, and sort of openly talk about the fact that that was going on. Um, so to me, that's, the, that, that's sort of the shift that happened. Um, so I, I'll, I'll turn it over to my, my colleagues. I think I, I would agree with Matt that there's, there's a consensus that there, you know, there's a case for concern. I think there's not a consensus on just how sort of severe that problem is and the kind, what level of urgency of a response and what type of response it requires. And so, so even saying, I, I think it's difficult in that sense to say there's a consensus. I think Washington is generally, you know, kind of there, but there's, there's definitely parts of, you know, American society and, and then of course in our allies and partners that aren't, aren't really, I think at the point that where Washington is. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like, I think Main Street is probably in a good place, but Wall Street maybe is not, right, is one example. Um, Hollywood maybe is not in the same place that Washington e is either. And so I think there's still sort of work to be done and, and sort of discussions to be had to sort of, I think, bring uh, a greater level of understanding, I think, you know, it's in, in my opinion, obviously, of, of just what is is at risk in this relationship. Sure. Thank yeah. you, Ed. Yeah, I agree with both Matt and Ivan. I do think there's an emerging consensus around this idea that strategic competition is the dominant feature of US-China relations. Um, you know, I think we need to push it a step further. I actually prefer how the EU characterizes it, their 2019 term, systemic rivalry. I think it even better captures the nature of this contest. Uh, between uh, autocracies and democracies. Um, I think you know, strategic competition is okay, but it, the word competition to me evokes maybe companies competing in a market where there's kind of agreed upon rules that are basically enforced, or maybe um, a soccer game where the playing field is even and the referee is um, objective and, and making good calls. Um, I don't think that really quite captures what's going on between China and you know, open market-oriented democracies where it really is a rivalry with both sides playing according to different rules and values. But um, sort of the hair splitting over that terminology aside, I do think there's an emerging consensus where I 
agree with Ivan's concern and would kind of build on that, there are still voices both in the administration and I think across American business and society that um, are advocating for cooperation or high level dialogue or engagement as the dominant feature of the relationship. And just to pause and acknowledge, I think that's a completely understandable impulse uh, when you think just in terms of game theory terms. It's, it's better to have uh, cooperation. You know, if both sides agree to cooperate, the outcomes are, are better than rivalry or, or lack of cooperation. But I think, unfortunately, um, a lot of folks both in the, the past administration and this one have come to the realization that China's playing a different game and while we may um, want to offer cooperation as a way to elicit more help from China on global problems that are very important, like climate change, um, they're actually operating according to their own, own rules and, and, and are not responding in the way that we would hope to those offers. Thanks, Liz. I, so what I'm hearing is I think there's agreement generally on the diagnosis of the problem, but it's the prescription where we're still a little bit uncertain. And I think Ivan brought up the key term, urgency. That's where there's a disagreement too within the prescription over, does this need to happen more quickly or do we have time and can, can go slow and, and can focus on other problems as well? I wanted to ask, again, Liza, you left, you made a good point at the end here about the, the nature of the competition. The, the three of you and, and myself included all had more of a, a military hard power and intelligence background looking at China. And I think that's where, you know, the intelligence community, DOD, are always a little bit earlier to these, to, to seeing these challenges because that's their job and thinking in several decades. But as we, as, as three of you involved in your careers and took these jobs at the NSC, you all in various capacities ended up focusing, focusing on technology competition and economic competition, um, which to me seems more like the language and, and, and of this competition and, and where perhaps um, the greatest amount of energy needed to be applied. Can you, can you jump in here a bit and talk about how you know, you had focused your whole careers on military and intelligence issues, but, but had to sort of evolve and, and see the nature of the competition changing as well. Again, so, jump in or, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, this administration, I think also in the Trump administration and the Biden administration, they sort of recognize that, you know, but very explicitly now that technology is, is sort of critical, and I think the way I look at it more is like technology sort of plays into all the others, whether it's the economic competition, the military competition, or even you know the diplomatic competition. And and if you look at some of the readings that that are sort of available from Beijing, you realize that that's where they are and have been very centered long before we were. That they believe that technology was going to lead to ultimately China's, you know, rise above the U.S. They believe, I think, very, very much widely believe that China, that the United States is on the decline. And this is what sort of drives a lot of um, the actions that, you know, the United States, you know, might be sort of responding to and create sort of the climate of the U.S.-China relations. And so technology naturally becomes um, a focal point because I think I think folks agree and see now, and you know I think the you know the national defense strategy, the last one, and I'm sure the coming one, as we'll see, uh, you know that's been previewed, will will sort of address these issues and how they how important they are in the security realm. But we also see it, you know, when you talk about uh, technology competition, both in investment, in trade, and things like that, how such a big impact it's having when you look at, you know, what we're doing with Department of Commerce, with export controls, with same thing with the talk, all the talk about investment um, and where technology flows with investment. Um, and that's why uh, these things are happening. I think we have to also understand that China has regarded these as melded for a long, long time, right? And so they've, you know, the hide and buy and all that was sort of like, the economics was in the front, but it was always part, and, and I believe for the Chinese Communist Party, that you know, security, their definition of security, which is slightly different than ours, it really means regime security or party security, but security was the ultimate goal you know, behind 
everything that's been happening for really decades. Yeah, I, and I completely agree. I, I, I came to appreciate that, that sort of the technological, economic, commercial, industrial domains were sort of the, the primary domains of competition uh, as I started to work for, uh, you know, so back in late 2014, uh, uh, Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel signs the Defense Innovation Initiative, you know, really recognizing that, that the challenges that, that, that the U.S. sort of defense establishment, you know, is going to be running into, you know, coming out of, you know, at that point in time, a, a decade and a half of, of sort of, of counterterrorism and counterinsurgency uh, sort of operations and that a refocus on the kinds of challenges being posed by, by near peer uh, or peer competitors um, was that, that, that fundamentally the way in which from a, from a national security perspective, we would derive our ability and, and strength to be able to sort of compete in the long term would be on that economic, uh, commercial, industrial, and technological sort of base. Um, and as, we, as I, I began to look at it from, from sort of the, the China policy angle, it became increasingly clear that, that clearly that's how Beijing conceptualized the competition, and that they were already moving in that direction. Um, and that as, that as we began to sort of look at this, um, that meant our primary focus had to shift from primarily viewing the economic relationship as, as mutually beneficial or beneficial to us as, as an area of highly contentious competition in which there are many ways in which that, that, that economic, commercial, technological relationship was, was disadvantageous to us the way that it was set up and that those things would need to change over time. Um, it's one of the reasons why, you know, when I, when I went to the White House, I was actually a, a Commerce Department employee. Um, is, you know, I, is, as I sort of spent the last 18 months of my time uh, in uniform in, in the Obama administration, um, it was primarily about work with, with our economic departments and agencies, uh, the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative and their efforts around standing up an interagency trade enforcement center to bring WTO cases against the PRC. It became essentially the, the main activity uh, in terms of enforcement of, of what we were doing, both at, at USTR and in any dumping countervailing duties in the Department of Commerce. Uh, you know, the reimagination of, of export controls and how those might be beneficial to our long-term uh, strategy, uh, the look and relook of, of how investment screening and investment security would take place. If, if we all remember that, that, you know, the debate around the reform of CFIUS, while the le legislation went into place uh, in, in mid-2018, the debate for that, that, that Senator Cornyn and, 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 and you know, his fellow senators sort of began really began at, at, in the last year or 18 months of the Obama administration as we were looking at activities of the PRC, sort of designing uh, attempts to gain access to cutting edge technology that were designed to get around the gaps and seams in our own investment screening regimes and the reform of that over time. And so much of that stuff was sort of taking place that the, the competition was actually unfolding in those domains. Right. And, and I, I felt largely from a, from a defense perspective, from a military perspective, you know, our, our job had often been to hedge against China's rise, right? Right all through sort of the, the 90s and 2000s. You know, we'll remember the, the Taiwan Strait crisis. We'll remember, you know, you know, we certainly had, you know, flights operating in the Western Pacific. We were doing freedom of navigation operations. So fundamentally, we sort of had the defense and military perspective, right? Which was to hedge and to plan for sort of worst case that fundamentally what needed to change within U.S. policy was on that economic side, right? right? That a shift towards viewing the relationship through a lens of competition and then adapting our tools and processes and policies to that reality. Right, and I'll, I'll give you the first bite at this, Liza, but how, um, how's our government organized for that? I, I had a supervisor, 2016 timeframe, who said, you know, and of course we have a China strategy, but we have five China strategies. There's a DOD strategy for China. There's a Commerce Department strategy for China. There's a Treasury Department strategy for China. That's evolved a little bit uh, in the last five years. Um, and perhaps the NSC, especially across Trump and Biden and the DOD have been more aligned. And the State Department as well. But are Commerce and Treasury still outliers 
Are, are, there, are there shifts going on there that, that, that we should be aware of? Uh, how do you see the breakdown? Because as we've recognized here, it's a whole of government issue, and I think we're starting to recognize that, but there still are some seams. If you want to first, first bite. Sure, thanks, Eric. Um, you know, I think up until a few years ago, the economic and perhaps even the technology aspects of the U.S.-China relationship were largely considered kind of a net good or an area of, of mutual benefit or even win-win, if I dare <laughs> to borrow the CCP's phrase. Um, you know, and ideas of decoupling or sort of the risky aspects of the relationship are almost, you know, downplayed or even a laughing stock. Um, but I think three shocks in the last few years have really challenged those assumptions. Um, and you all know what they are, of course, you know, the trade war under former President Trump and then, then COVID. And then, of course, most recently, just in the last few weeks, the sudden decoupling of Russia from many advanced economies has, I think, caused a lot of people to go back and question the assumptions about whether this, you know, bilateral um, economic and technological entanglement is really um, as, as good as we thought. So, you know, Beijing has always viewed the economic and technology aspects of development to be fundamental. I think that's clear. Um, and U.S.-China relations were sort of premised on that for a long time. And I think in, in the last few years, that's started to shift. So, you know, is the U.S. government postured to deal with that, Eric? I think um, they're coming around, but I think the differences between our systems, uh, the U.S. system and China, is really where we're struggling. And, um, you know, we still have a, a larger economy. We have, you know, larger investment flows and all the rest. But the U.S. government just doesn't um, have, nor should it have, the same leverage over our private sector that Beijing has over their, you know, quasi-private sector, which is, is not really a private sector at all. Um, so I think we are really um, looking for new ideas and new models for how the U.S. government can partner with the private sector, uh, which is much better at speed, at agility, at innovation than the U.S. government ever will be um, without, um, you know, we're never going to get to the, the, the stance of kind of trying to out China China. I, you know, that's not going to happen in our system. But what are some new models where we can kind of overcome um, uh, some of these gaps in our system? What, yeah, I mean, I think to me, it's it's very clear that <clears throat> from the end of yeah you know, the end of the Cold War um, through about 2015, we we actually had a fairly clear national strategy. Um, our economic departments and agencies uh, were sort of the main effort of that strategy. And, and their job was to help the Chinese economy develop and grow uh, with the theory that, that the development and growth of the Chinese economy, expansion of a middle class, you know, a moving up of the value chain, uh, you know, uh, you know, as, 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 as the, as the you know, per capita GDP of Chinese citizens rose, that, that all of those things would lead to the kind of political liberalization that would solve the, na that the national security and human rights concerns that we had, right? And so to a certain degree, that strategy from really about May of 1994, when, when, when President Clinton um, sort of decided uh, to sort of accept a, a, an idea of, of sort of changing sort of his administration's policy to sort of embracing uh, the PRC economically, and, and it sort of led down the road to permanent normal trade relations, China's entry into the WTO, right? That that, that, that transition um, really from what had been a, a, a Cold War concept of, of our relationship with the PRC, which was primarily viewed through a lens of using the PRC you know, uh, as, as a tool against the Soviet Union. You know, as the Soviet Union disappeared, that, that was no longer necessary, and we transitioned to sort of you know, a, a peace through trade, uh, use trade, using our economic relationship to, to grow that. Obviously, the, the US military and the intelligence community you know, had a hedging role during that time, and, and it wasn't until sort of 2014, 2015 that the consensus around that began to weaken. It was largely because we began to assess that, that it didn't appear 
<laughs> that political liberalization was happening. Um, and Beijing was very much developing economically. And in fact, coming into a position in which to challenge um, our ability to maintain that, that hedging and the ability to sort of maintain uh, a, a position to guard against the worst case outcomes. And so it was that, that transition point. And, and you know, one could view it as sort of a, through a realist lens and that, and that the US would view this as a beneficial strategy and policy up until we began to assess that in fact it wasn't all that beneficial and then we began to change. And so I think to me this is a, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a sort of a phase change in, in how the US thinks about it. Now that means that, that economic departments and agencies that had spent two decades focused on how to help the Chinese economy develop and grow had to go through a really tough time in which you know, everything that they had been doing in, in the relationship had been focused in one direction and they're now being asked to do different things. And it creates, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it creates friction within the bureaucracy to sort of think about how to do that. But I think now we've started to see that we've essentially had, and I would count sort of three administrations, right? The end of the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and now the Biden administration, sending very clear political signals that this is, this is the direction we're taking this. And, that, and I, I would point that all the way back to, to Secretary Clinton's sort of signals in 2011 and 2012 that the, Biden, that the Obama administration began and that there is a, there's a continuity through that to where we are today. Yeah. And, and that, just, that just means that it takes a long time for departments and agencies to do different things. Right, and, and Ivan and Liza, do you think that, well, I'm glad Matt brought it to the elections because we should talk about that. Uh, it's probably important to say that we're stepping back from the elections to start this and talk about how things have changed, but, but did the elections in 16 and then in 20, it sounds to me, Matt, that you're saying that that accelerated a process that was already underway. It didn't take us in a, a new direction. Yeah, I, I, I think, um, you, know, you know, again, as a, as a historian, right, as an American historian that, that looks at American political history, there, are, there, are, there, is, there is continuity and change that happens across our, our, our sort of political breakpoints. And in this case, I think there is far more evidence of continuity across those breakpoints than there is of, of change, right? That, that there is this deep sort of uh, uh, strain of continuity that really comes from, and, and you know, I look back to the end of the Obama administration, you've got a handful of folks, Ash Carter, Bob Work, uh, Penny Pritzker at Commerce, Mike Froman at, at, at USTR, um, uh, Sarah Bloom Raskin at Treasury, who are highly skeptical of the, of the overall US policy approach to the PRC and are demanding a real relook. Avril Haines is another person, right? And, and obviously there isn't full consensus, but they're clearly sort of driving different things. If you go back to a speech that, that that Secretary Pritzker gave four days before the election in 2016 at CSIS, it reads like the, the preface to Ambassador Lighthizer's Section 301 investigation. It's about the harm that Chinese industrial policies do uh, to, US, to a US industry. This is mostly around semiconductors, but it reads very much like continuity. And to me, this is, this is often sort of what's missed within the sort of broader, more uh, pageantry-filled partisan politics of how we view U.S. policy, right. and then in this case, this is there's far more continuity. Right. I think um, it's important. You know, it wasn't just the failure to achieve the political liberalization. I think sort of when we talk about the USTR issues and those, it was it was the failure to achieve even the economic liberalization. I mean, it was yeah. this this infusion and this creation of you know what folks call state capitalism, right? Which I think you know there's an app description. There's different ways to explain it but it's clearly not the economic model that we were trying to build as we sort of developed the policies to sort of, you know, and, you know, to be truthful, deliberately transfer technologies and know-how and things to China in order to create, you know, this better world that we thought. So I think, I think it was the political part, we, we never really saw too much, you know, Progress on there was the other, little, other than little, village little elections. For there was some slack there were, period. Yeah, there was a little bit, but but I think, but I think it was sort of eventually just just 
you know, as you mentioned, sort of on both sides, the economic agencies also understanding that we're kind of pushing against a closed door. Yep. Yeah, just to chime in a little bit there, I agree with both of my colleagues. Um, and having lived through the transition from the Trump administration to the Biden administration, I'll just put some color on it. I mean, the new team came in in January 2021, and there was no backwards looking review of the last administration's China policy. There was a media narrative that we kept trying to correct unsuccessfully that, oh, there's this China policy review and we would get questions, when is your China policy review going to be done? And we would kind of scratch our heads. Now, the caveat, there was a review of the trade policy and the tariffs in the phase one in 2021, which was kind of completed last year. Uh, so that was that was one backward looking review. And some of that was because there were certain deadlines that had to be met. So it had to be reviewed. There were decisions that had to be made for statutory reasons. Um, but in general, the new team, team came in and were decidedly forward looking in saying, you know, we basically agree with the last administration's assessment, which is, as Matt has pointed out, really goes back and kind of started even before the Trump administration. Um, and I would say where there was, I, I agree with Matt, continuity outweighed change. And where there was change, I would characterize it as, as mainly in terms of uh, style and rhetoric, pace, and perhaps emphasis with kind of a greater emphasis on what do we need to do here in the United States to run faster and basically outcompete China. I think the emphasis shifted, but uh, the policy direction remained the same. That's, yeah, perfect. I'm glad we, we brought it up to kind of the present. Um, just my, my last question. Um, you know, what's tenuous about this new approach? We, we've, we've crossed in, over multiple administrations. There's a historical arc, as, as Mass described. Um, you know, we're in the, in the fifth week of, of, a, of a war in Europe. Uh, is it distraction, a regional distraction outside of the Indo-Pacific? Is it misalignment in those scenes we were talking about at the Commerce Department or, or the Treasury Department where there's where missions can be um, um, uh, pulling in different directions? at best, uh, or, or is it something else? What are the, we talked a bit too, Ivan, about, about urgency being kind of a key factor that this, a lot of this is going to hinge on in the next few years. You know, just to finish, and then we'll go to the audience here, you know, what do you see as kind of the, the challenges to this, this new approach the next few years and beyond this administration? I can start if you like. Uh, sure. I, you know, I think you've, you mentioned the war in Ukraine, and really I think this question of what is next for U.S.-China bifurcation or perhaps to put it more accurately, that this coming bifurcation between China and the U.S. and many of its allies, I think, you know, I, I sort of pointed out the big shocks that mean we can't any longer uh, be naive in how we think about the risks inherent in economic and technological entanglement. Um, but that doesn't mean the path forward is clear. So I guess I would just propose that this debate that we've been having in Washington for the last couple of years over decoupling, we just need to move beyond that. I think it's an OBE debate uh, when it's framed in these black and white terms of, do we want decoupling or not? Is it good or bad? Is it possible or impossible? I think those are far too black and white debates. And I think it's now time to just say, Look, it's, it's happening in some sectors. It's happening in some supply chains. Uh, the pace that it's happening is very different across different sectors. Um, but we need to face reality. And the reality is that on both sides of the Pacific, uh, both in Beijing with the, the tech lash and dual circulation, and in Washington with strategic competition, there are certain trends underway. And the companies and analysts and government agencies that are preparing for this are going to be more <coughs> resilient in the future. Thanks. Anything to add? So I think um, it's funny, Liza's right, that we're, we're not going to out China China. But, it, but you know, in another sense, there are a lot of things we're doing that do look a bit like what China's been doing, right? I mean, we, you know, five years ago, the term industrial policy is a bad word, you know, in Washington. And it kind of it makes sense now. But truthfully, if you go back, you know, before the post-Cold War era, we did a lot of this, um, and we, we just need to sort of flex those muscles again. So it's not so much 
doing what China did. It's going back, I think, to, to our own history, right? On things like that. And when you dual circulation um, it is, is two things, you know, the way I look at it in my reading of it. And one of them is, is very much something that we're doing, which is sort of making ourselves more resilient and having sort of more uh, reliable sort of supply chains of our own, right? I mean, that's a core element of dual circulation for China. They see risk also, and they want to make themselves self-reliant. Um, that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad instinct, obviously, because that's our instinct right now, too, which, again, goes against sort of maybe the trend of the last couple decades, but, but I, I would say not against the trend of American history in general. Um, I think the danger of all this, to answer your question, Eric, is sort of, and the, the current administration obviously is very focused on this, but sort of what about the rest of the world? And sort of the, the ally slash partner question um, and, and you know the tensions that obviously the current administration is struggling with, um, not necessarily struggling with, but has to deal with. Um, we've got you know very good alignment on the Russia question. I think there's there's a whole another set of issues when it comes to China um, for all kinds of reasons that you all know. Um, but it's important to sort of understand that most of the world's population is not sort of necessarily sold on, you know, I guess if we say democracy versus autocracy, that's not really the choice that they want to be presented with. Um, and so sort of how we go about this in the longer term, I think will be um, one of the important things right, we have to great. figure out. Yeah. Hold that thought for me, Matt, and let's go to the audience and we'll, we'll come back. Yep. Um, Corey Shock. Thanks, I'm Corey Shockey from AAI. <laughs> Matt, you mentioned uh, Hollywood and Wall Street as outliers from Main Street. Ivan, you did as well. Tech companies, the big five tech companies, how serious a problem are they in terms of tech transfer and continued assistance and cutting edge um, defense relevant areas? And what should we do about it? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously, some of those big five tech companies don't have a footprint in the PRC as, as they have been excluded. Um, and, and obviously, some have uh, very large ones. Um, you know, and I think the dividing line is really over uh, you know, sort of manufacturing and that sort of side, right? If you're in, if you're in the sort of the tech information space, right, the, the information technology, uh, social networks, and those sorts of things, the PRC is not at all interested in having uh, firms that they do not fully control you know, active inside their market. And I think increasingly, those companies that from, from the United States who are in that sector are increasingly understanding that, right? That they, 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 it has sunk in that they, they just, you know, they just ain't gaining market access anytime in the near future. Um, now, for those who do manufacturing, right, and 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 you know, obviously there are, you know, very large and substantial uh, companies that sort of do you know, consumer electronic manufacturing inside the PRC. Um, I think since 2018, uh, you know, they have begun a, a process of a China Plus One manufacturing policy, right, which is to it, which is to diversify uh, their manufacturing base. And I think part of this has to do with sort of changes in U.S. policy. But I think also has to do with, with realizations within these companies is that one way to protect themselves from potential retaliation by the PRC uh, is to have options, right? That, that if the PRC were to come to them and say, you know, this factory here, you know, the fire inspection is sort of out of date and we're going to have to shut down production here, a company can say, well, that's really bad. I'm going to have to lay off those workers and I'll just ramp up production in some other country. And that serves as a deterrent against Beijing's decisions and the things that they might do. And I think this has just been a lesson learned across. Um, I think you know, one of the things that, you know, to, to carry off of, of, of Liza's comment about sort of decoupling, and I think that we, you know, particularly here in Washington, have gotten sort of wrong about this, is that fundamentally this is about, uh, you know, we want to maintain uh, uh, the PRC vulnerable to things that, that, that we do, right? 
Um, and we want to make ourselves less vulnerable to things that they do, right? And of course, the PRC is following the same logic, right? Right? Um, you know, I often had to remind folks that, that you know, much of the point of the trade war was to get Beijing to buy more things from us, right? not to decouple. Um, we wanted to create those kinds of dependencies. Right? You want to have those kind of, of advantageous, from your perspective, dependencies in a long-term strategic competition. Right? PRC uh, depending upon us for foodstuffs. PRC depending upon us for liquefied natural gas. Uh, depending upon us for certain types of semiconductors. All things that are potentially beneficial in the long term for our approach. But of course, Beijing is going to be following the opposite strategy. And so that will likely lead to a sort of a net reduction in those sorts of things. But each side will have some defendancies. And, and to a certain degree, what they might lead us to in the long term is strategic stability, right? To a certain degree of strategic stability. And I think this is the challenge that we're in right now is that we're moving from one approach to a new approach. And there is a great degree of sort of systemic risk that comes from that transition. But if you sort of look at this over the long term, we finally get ourselves to a degree of strategic stability, and we have some sort of understanding between each country, and we're probably in a much safer and more stable relationship over time. And that's probably a good thing for both sides, right? That, that we are able to sort of move in that direction. And that requires both sides to sort of think about those, that sort of relationship in sort of different ways. And so I, I, I'm sort of optimistic about where this goes. It's this, it's this transition period that is going to be tough. Uh, one more from the audience. Anybody? Sir, I think we have a microphone for you. Yeah, just two seconds. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Hudson LaForce, private citizen. Building on the point you just made, if I may, um, this idea of strategic stability, is that a sort of economic mutually assured destruction that keeps things stable over time? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you could, you know, again, I, 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 I caution to sort of, you know, our temptation to use all of the sort of uh, Cold War tropes. Um, you know, that, that might not be, you know, the best way to sort of think about this. But to a certain degree, that, that is kind of the direction that you sort of head in, right? There are things that, that we're interested in selling to them, right? And they're okay with buying from us. And we're gonna have some sort of reciprocal kind of relationship, right? That doesn't get rid of the tension, but it potentially sort of mitigates some of the worst sort of fears and, and paranoias that both sides will have. And you'll sort of move into a different relationship. I think for, for US businesses uh, and for multinationals, right, this is, absolutely critical for them to sort of see and perceive this now, right? That, that you've moved from a strategy of the US government incentivizing and encouraging investment, uh, uh, additional manufacturing, the transfer of technology in order to help the PRC economy grow to a, actually, we're going to be much more circumspect about this. And, and I, you know, there is a, I think that it's incredibly important for, for companies to understand that, that business models follow geopolitics, not the other way around. And that it means that, that our business models will change to suit themselves to the new geopolitics of the situation, right? And if, and if, if Ukraine hasn't provided uh, you know, an exclamation point to that, to that truism, then I don't know what else does. But essentially, Business models, investors, C-suites, boards of directors need to be fundamentally relooking all of the assumptions that they had about how the way the world would be organized. That doesn't mean there will be no trade. It just means that it will likely be reformed over time. And at the end of that sort of reformation, we'll find ourselves in a new normal. And then we'll expect that that, that is sort of the best practice of, of how our business, commercial, and economic relationships are organized. And we'll look back at sort of the, the heady days of the 2000s and the early teens as the, what were we sort of thinking of then? And so I think that that's just sort of a natural progression. It's, it's gonna create, it's, it's fundamentally creative destruction of the kind of business models. That doesn't mean there won't be winners, there'll likely be different winners in the future rather than the old incumbents who are you know, really 
the loudest voices today you know, asking for there to be no change. And I think that's just, just not realistic. Like, we're going to see a change to the status quo. Probably better to get in front of that and adapt to that new, that new reality. One minute, anything to add on that, Liza, Ivan? I think it's just... Go ahead. Well, I think, you know, you said mutual assured destruction, right? And, like, you know, everyone thinks nuclear stuff. And so this goes back to the earlier point about technology. And I think that's where um, things are the most sort of sensitive, right? And that's where, for example, you know, LNG and wheat and, you know, rice or whatever, pretty fungible. And, like, if I get cut off because of political reasons or this, that, I'll find another buyer somewhere else. We see that a little bit with what, what's happening with Australia. But if, you know, Huawei or ZTE builds the 5G in Washington, D.C., I can't undo that. That's a sensitive kind of, and, and if they decide to flip the switch off one day, what am I left with? I can't go buy, you know, a new infrastructure overnight. So I think, you know, kind of understanding what, what will be acceptable sort of going forward and what, what will not and figuring out where those lines are and, again, sort of how fast we need to go. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Just sort of adding on to Matt's point about companies and, and governments needing to be ready for this, I would just remind people, I, I think we will be caught off guard if we're complacent about China. I think it, it, there's not a static picture of where China is and their technology strategy is evolving all the time and they're putting out new strategies and they have made it quite clear where they want to be in coming years in terms of gaining market share in all of the strategic technology sectors that will dominate the future of the world economy. So I think that you know companies and governments need to be paying attention to where China's goals are. That is not to say that China will achieve all of its goals, but um, you know, going back to maybe around 2015 or 2016, I think there started to be a sea change between Western observers of China's technology development kind of dismissing them and saying they can't really innovate, they're just copying, to we started to wake up to, oh, they're actually starting to achieve some of their ambitions. So um, I think that that future that Matt is describing looks very different in different sectors where perhaps we don't have choke points anymore or where China is actually getting ahead of us. In the last three or four minutes, I just want to go to some of the questions online. You wouldn't be surprised to learn most of them are about Ukraine and what this means and what does it mean for Taiwan and what does it mean for U.S. focus on the region. So to close it out, um, some of your thoughts on you know, the current state of, of, of U.S. focus and, and what it actually means and how it will what it all means for what we're discussing today going forward. So, uh, you know, I'm optimistic um, that this is, you know, helpful in the ways that Matt talked about on people understanding that we are sort of well past sort of where, where terrorism or even the Middle East <laughs> is sort of the predominant sort of security um, focus for the United States. And we're really moving toward you know, this competition level. And that's good. The other thing that, that's optimistic is sort of what you see in Europe, in Germany in particular. Um, and by optimistic, I mean assuming a greater part of the burden. Um, and, we, and we see that, you know, whether that's through spending or through diplomacy or what have you. And as they do that, that should, you know, in theory, alleviate a little bit the burden of the United States and if we're more, you know, maybe that allows us to focus more on the Pacific region, but maybe it also gets the Europeans to also focus more on the Pacific region because they have more resources in the security realm. And so I think, I think those are, are good things. The, the one other thing I'll highlight, you know, if you didn't see it, you know, again, coming from the China side, is that the narrative there is, is still very much, you know, ex is explicitly that the situation in Ukraine, which... Obviously, they don't call a war in China um, or an invasion, but the situation in Ukraine is because NATO broke its promise. Like, that is the cause. That's the underlying cause. And, oh, by the way, just as dangerous as NATO expanding eastward is this other thing the U.S. is doing called the Indo-Pacific strategy. That is explicitly the Chinese official line right now, and I think, you know, that's 
something we need to consider um, every day. Yep. Last minute, anybody? Yeah. Thanks. Um yeah, I, and one thing I'd, I'd, you know, that we didn't cover, but I would I'd point out is that obviously the U.S. isn't alone in this transition. Um, in fact, you know, our colleagues, uh, you know, in Japan, yeah, I'd, I'd clearly point out that that you know after the the rare earth embargo over the Senkakus and everything else, you know, as as Prime Minister Shinzo Abe came in, um, the LDP very much took this on themselves. And began their own transition, and they've all they've begun this process of thinking about diversifying. You know, thinking about sort of what are the new business models. You know, they've been outspending the PRC and infrastructure development in Southeast Asia for a decade, right? So that this has already been going on. We in Washington, I think, find it tough uh, to look beyond our, our the Beltway about you know, that anyone else is sort of doing anything. Um, but but any sort of you know, broader and objective look at what's going on is that. You know, clearly, the um, you know, third largest economy in the world was sort of lead turning us on this, you know, to, to, to borrow a, a, a jet term. Um, uh, so, and the other part I'd, I'd sort of make um, is that, you know, I, I think you know, there's, you know, there's been a number of folks who sort of made this comment, uh, so I don't know who to attribute it to, but, but we are coming to the end of our, of our vacation from history, right? This idea that, that we lived in this overwhelmingly normative world in which the rule of law, international sort of uh, uh, norms uh, was the, the underlying organizing principle and that everything could be resolved through sort of normative systems um, and that there were a handful of rogue regimes and terrorist groups that sat outside of that and those were national security issues but everything else could be handled within the international system that we had, the liberal international system we had set up. And I think we are coming to the to the sort of the end of the realization, you know, the, the end of the, the period of time where we think that 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 those sorts of non-normative behaviors by major powers could could happen, and that we are realizing that in fact that is the case. Now, I, I would argue we probably should have gained that impression back in 2008 when 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 the Russians invaded Georgia, or maybe in 2014 when they you know, first invaded Ukraine, um, and and maybe as the as the PRC sort of laughed off island building in the South China Sea and its explicit threats to use force against Taiwan or against Japan, maybe we should have realized it then, but we actually are beginning to realize it now and we're organizing for that. And to me, that, that means that sort of once we head down that path, it's really hard to imagine how you would sort of come back to you know, a same sort of naive look at how the world works. And it means we're sort of on a different pathway. And I think that's a... That, Ultimately, I think Beijing has to be quite concerned about that development. It has been, it has been a development that they have been guarding against and seeking to prevent uh, for quite some time. And to be honest, they have not achieved the goals that they needed to achieve before we realized that. And right. so I think this sets us up for what will likely be a long and difficult competition, but one that we should feel very optimistic about our chances. Right. In. Closing comments, Liz. Yeah, so I mean, Matt has described very well how history is accelerating, and in some ways it's rhyming with episodes of history like the Cold War that we've lived through before. But what does Ukraine teach us about how to think about China? I think there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good, I mean, the consensus we developed with Europe and many of our other advanced economy allies and partners was really astounding. Um, the decoupling with Russia was quite, quite sudden. And so I think we were surprised on the upside by how quickly we could agree with many of our allies to use economic coercion against Vladimir Putin, and that's a good thing. Um, the bad, of course, is that if we think about using this against China in a, in a different scenario, of course, we're, uh, China's 10 times as big. We're much more entangled with China economically and technologically. So not all of the same lessons apply, but I think some of them do. Um, and then the ugly, of course, is that China can wage and does wage economic warfare against us in ways that are much more significant than Russia can. Um, but nonetheless, I, I share your optimism, and I think that you know now it's incumbent on us to do the math. I mean, really look at and examine in a granular fashion where those dependencies are and where companies and governments need to revisit them. Thanks. Liza, Ivan, Matt, thanks for kind of this unique experience. Um, I think it's an optimistic take on where we've come and where we're going as difficult as it's going to be. 
Um, I think as well, if you're a, uh, an aspiring kind of foreign policy practitioner, you know, the takeaway, well, in addition to choose this path and you can find your way to Hawaii at some point in your career, like we said earlier, <laughs> the other takeaway is um, not only is this the, the future and where we're going to spend the next couple of decades, um, but th there's a lot more to learn than just the South China Sea and strategic stability and, and the, the military issues that we all learn about in, in, in graduate school. Um, you need to train yourself in the language of economics and technology and finance uh, to be relevant and be at the table as, as all three of you did in, in the last five years and in your time at the NSC. So uh, thanks again for joining us. Thanks to the audience for coming in person and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks.